and this goes for those of us that do astronomy outreach as well. If the sure. people in your audience feel like you are spontaneous and uh, ready to give a go of any request or uh, question or answer on any at any given time, then in fact, uh, I think it increases the respect that the audience has for you. And uh, oh, maybe, yeah, I mean, because I mean, I am at my worst when I'm too prepared, you know, <laughs> and so um, I, you know, I have uh, I've learned to just um, uh, work with the audience and work, you know, I, I love it when I have, you know, someone like you, I can interact with and everything. So, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, Becca from Stockholm is on here. Yeah, yeah. your audience should know. Uh, I think that although this, these programs are prepared, they're not scripted. No. And uh, this isn't a, uh, this is much more like a classroom or an outreach situation. It's not like a show. You right. Know, Dr. Sagan or uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson gets on their program and that's really highly scripted and oh, yeah. every word is planned. And if it doesn't go as planned, the director says, cut and we'll do it again. Do it and, again. Uh, <laughs> you and I from <laughs> teaching and sales, which I think we both have some of that. In yep. our, you know, oh yeah. Uh, different amounts certainly, but uh you know, and I know that you don't get that luxury of a scripted environment. You have no. to, and you don't know you don't know how your customer is going to be, uh, you know, reacting or absorbing sure. what you're saying, or sure, you know, sure. those kinds of things. So if you, uh, there are salespeople that just, and customer service people that do a script. Okay, oh, I and know. I it's very bothered. annoying. I think to the, to the person on the other end, it is to me. I think I and uh, loads of people I know, they are, hi, I'm here to talk to you about your car warranty. And we just go, and you start asking, really, hey, how passionate are you about my car warranty anyways? And they, they keep on going and it becomes clear they're reading the script and click, the phone is just bang, I'm hanging up on you now. <laughs> yeah. I've had to tell customer service reps, I, I would say, <clears throat> hello, and I would have to interrupt and I would say, just listen to me, okay? Stop reading your script. Okay, are you reading your script? Put it down, okay? <laughs> and you and I are gonna talk. Yes, that's sometimes <clears throat> very disconcerting to the script reader. Oh, big time. They're nervous. They don't wanna get away from the script yeah, if, it's they, okay. if it's they okay, rely but, on it. Uh, uh, it's, it's kind of odd. And if you, if you look at my uh, reviews of me from students, it's kind of Jekyll and Hyde. Hmm. And, uh, but the people who uh, aren't happy tend to fall into two camps. The one camp says, well, uh, he's not flexible enough and he doesn't meet my special needs. And hmm. the other one says, oh my God, he's changing things all the time. Can't he just find something and stick to it? And so it's a kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't situation, but you realize that, uh, you can never make all of your audience happy at one time. Oh, no, no. Uh, somebody's always got a little bit different expectation. I was thrilled, by the way. I've gotten some nice comments, and I'm hoping I'll read some of these when the show begins. I've gotten some emailed to me from various teachers who saw the show, and those are really nice. And I thought I might That's cool. a couple of those. That's and, cool. Uh, I really enjoy. I, I don't really see them as the show goes on because I'm too busy, but I really enjoy looking at the comments afterward. I yeah. go and watch the show over on YouTube. I know there are people who say, I never watch my performances. Uh, but no, I, I love to go back and watch well, the performances I, I and see the comments come up in real time. If it's a live show, I think you do want to see it, you know, because, um, you know, you want, uh, you want to know how you're, you know, what success level you're having with your audience. So. Yes. And uh, I also kind of cringe because every once in a while I make a, I make a bobble. Uh, I think I referred to Aristotle oh, as Galileo okay. once in the last show. That's how they oh, know well. it's live. <laughs> that's called live TV, folks. That's called live show. That's, that's real life. Yeah, that's real life. So um, I try to tell 
people, outreach people and student teachers as well. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to make errors. And mm -hmm. you simply have to be, uh, you can't apologize for them. It's, it's worthless. And uh, I often, I tell my students, and I've gone by this for years, sorry is the one, it's, it's the one horrible swear word I don't allow in my classroom. I you don't allow, allow sorry. I huh? Very, ah, I get theatrically enraged if someone <laughs> says I'm sorry. Because uh, sorry is often used by uh, students to say, I'm really done listening to you, old guy, old bald guy. Can, can we stop this now? Sorry, sorry, okay, sorry. They're really saying, shut up now. I'm done with the conversation. <laughs> the other thing I tell them is that uh, sorry is absolutely, I'm not interested in your sorrows. Sorry is worthless. I want to know your plan for improvement. I want to know how you're going to be better. And uh, that's, always, that's always a worthwhile pursuit. Apologies are not, improvement is. So there we go. That's an odd theme for today's show about Galileo, who didn't apologize for anything. He did recant, but he never apologized. Okay, everybody, it's uh, it's uh, Scott Roberts with Explore Scientific and Daniel Barth on our sixth episode of How Do You Know, okay? And this has to do with Galileo and gravity and pendulums and... All of that is kind of a, um, it's kind of like part two of uh, episode five, session. really. Yeah. Right? And uh, we're probably going to cut a little bit shorter today than we often do. I have, uh, I have a thesis defense to go to. It's one of my teacherly duties, at the university at two o'clock. So we're going we're gonna to kind of crank through. Before we get started, though, I did want to share, Scott, a couple of nice comments. I, I have some people who've emailed me who aren't on the live chat, people who saw mm -hmm. the show afterwards. And uh, one uh, teacher said, I think this will be used in my classroom a lot, not as a physics teacher, but as a biology teacher, because Dr. Barth explains how science should be taught. Uh, another teacher said, I want to teach my students every step, how the experiment was developed it, who tested it, whether or not it was initially supported or rejected, and even if the experiment may have been developed off of a different idea from somebody else, I realize the history of science is important. Uh, another teacher said, I'm glad the activity uses materials that are easily accessible and relatively cheap if we don't already have them. It's so important that activities and projects are affordable so all students have equal access. Uh, another teacher said, I plan on keeping a link to this YouTube channel so I can refer to this series in the future. I feel like I have a coworker and a friend who will always have ideas I need for science materials. So I, I was just, oh my gosh. I'm yeah, here. well, we have another nice uh, uh, comment here. Uh, James, the astrophotographer's on. Um, uh, so he, he has to say, uh, I've shared these segments with my sister-in-law, who's a teacher in San Diego. That's really cool. Great. And uh, Pekka says, we have, a, oh, these out there imaging. We have super clear skies over here in Stockholm tonight. That's awesome. Nice. Uh, there'll be some, uh, some large scope for sure. Okay, that's cool. That's terrific. Yeah. So we'll, we'll let you get started, Daniel. That's um, good. Um, for uh, our teacher friend in San Diego and for everybody else who's watching, uh, if you haven't already done so, I encourage you to download Astronomy for Educators. It really is astronomy for everyone, for everyone who wants to do outreach and activity and parents and teachers. And uh, there's a link on the uh, page at explorescientific.com slash how do you yep. know? Or you I'll can put in, put in Astronomy for Educators in my name, Daniel Barth, in any search engine and it'll pop up for you. It will. That's and right. So want to encourage you. We're, uh, we now have over... Uh, almost 4,600 users worldwide uh, with the book and the program, which just thrills me. And the uh, Explore Scientific and sponsoring the How Do You Know show has been a big part of that. Really appreciate the sponsorship. Thank you. So here we go. Let's go ahead and talk about Galileo today. And it's kind of part two from last week, Newton discovers gravity, and we're doing it in anti-chronological order. Uh, Galileo discovered these ideas first 
And well, discovered is a, is a, is a problematic word. Galileo was one of the uh, first people to really identify them and I investigate gravity scientifically and mathematically. He never in his life managed to work out all the mathematics. And uh, we're going to go a little deeper into the math this week. Don't be afraid, Corinne. don't tune out. It's not gonna be bad. Uh, it'll be easy and straightforward. And we're actually going to explain Galileo's ideas using some of Newton's math. But we're gonna stay real simple and straightforward. Let's talk about what we're gonna learn about science today. First of all, and this is kind of a theme for us, old and established ideas aren't necessarily true. Science, uh, there seems to be a trend today of people saying, you know, 99 out of 100 scientists agree, or we've always done it this way, or everybody mm. knows. Uh, genuine scientific investigators kind of reject these ideas. Yes. Science doesn't care about polls. And uh, we owe no veneration to the past. We owe, we owe these ideas skepticism and investigation because the idea that the science is finished, and I, I've seen posts like this, is physics finished? I've seen these in the last couple finished? of Finished? It seems like it's just getting started. It's just getting, the cool stuff is just coming up. <laughs> <laughs> right. But um, we owe no veneration to the past. We owe the people of the past a great debt, but we pay that debt with skepticism and investigation, not with, you know, bowing down in homage. Um, the other thing we're going to talk about is that there's a lot of times there's subtle connections in science. Just because everybody's seen it doesn't mean anyone's understood it. How long, Scott, have we had pendulums where we take something and tick tock? Long time. A long time. And Galileo in the 1600s is watching, in fact, an incense sensor in church. Again, one of these apocryphal stories. And... Uh, comes up with these brilliant ideas and like Newton with the apple, perhaps it's an apocryphal story, but it points out something interesting. Lots of people have seen it. Doesn't mean anybody, everybody's wrung all the juice out of it or that we all understand it just because we've seen it. Um, the idea we're going to investigate today is a pendulum isn't just swinging, it's actually falling. This is a wonderful Ooh. analog to a satellite in orbit, whether that's a moon, or a weather satellite, or you know, one of the Starlink internet satellites that astronomers have a love-hate relationship with. Satellites in orbit around anything, planets in orbit around a star, they're free falling. They're falling. Why don't you fall in the space station? And one of the things astronauts answer in live shows from the Apollo, the ISS, we're all falling together. So of course I can't fall down to anywhere when the whole room I'm in is falling at the same rate. And the other thing we're going to talk about today is we can often see and describe a pattern before we understand it mathematically. We see something, we say, ooh, that's interesting. Constellations are an idea. They actually have a structure 3D in space. Star clusters are in there. Globular clusters are in there. We look at them and we go, ooh, pretty. All the stars gather together in a bunch. And then the questions start. Why does that happen? Why are some clusters open and some are dense? Uh, how old are they? Were they all born together or did they gravitationally fall together? Why don't they all smash together into one giant star or a black hole? And so we see these patterns all the time in real life. And it's as we think about them, investigate them, and maybe bring a little bit of mathematics to bear uh, that we start to explore these things in a powerful way. I, uh, you know, Scott, I'm a shy man who's who's subtle about my opinion. Yeah, <laughs> so shy. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's a lie. Uh, I think we teach mathematics all wrong across the United States and much around the world. I think we need to teach mathematics as a practical tool, the way we teach someone to use a wrench or a hammer. I, I think we teach it as this theoretical puzzle game, which is wonderful. But oftentimes I've seen in teaching physics and chemistry, the ideas that we're dealing with mathematically, with gravity, with torque, with acceleration, with rotation, the mathematics for these students have had since seventh grade, but they've never applied them. So they right. just became some, I'm doing this for the test. Or, you know, I used to, I was never a good math student. I always described math to my teachers as this evil puzzle. Uh, and I would constantly raise my hand and say, what is it good for? 
which got me uh, many reprimands. And yes. uh, back in the day, the reprimand was often delivered with a paddle. Uh, back in the day. <laughs> That's the old days. That's, That's right. the old days. We don't do that now. Don't do that, right. kids. Teachers, don't do that. Get you fired. Mm. That's right. Uh, but nevertheless, I finally got into a physics class. And I said, what's it good for? And the teacher said, well, let's find out. And he started with something very much like we're going to do today. So I hope if you have, if math gives you, you know, a squeezy feeling in the pit of your stomach, I hope you'll come along today and see that it, as a useful tool, it can actually be kind of fun and interesting and uh, not some awful puzzle game when you actually see what it's for and how it's applied. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and we're going to talk about our activity today. And we're going to do pendulums. And I'm going to show you uh, a lovely picture here. And I'm going to switch this over. Here we are. I'm going to share a screen. And this is just a simple photo. It's not a photo, it's a drawing. And what we have here, you can see it's just a uh, bunch of washers tied on a string. And in fact, I'm going to do something today. Washers are really nice because you can find them anywhere. Any home improvement store has them. A lot of people have, you know, boxes of them in your garage. And if you want to make a greater weight, you just tie a few more washers on. And so with pendulums, one of the things we're going to investigate is weight. And I'm going to go ahead and stop the share and come back now. So what we've done today is we're going to investigate something Galileo investigated. And that is, why do different things that weigh differently fall at the same speed? And uh, uh, I think I mentioned to you before the show, Scott, my, my desire uh, was to bring in a different prop today. I have a baseball, uh, one of my favorite props. I have a t-ball. And at work, I have a four-inch chrome steel ball bearing. It weighs something stupid, like three kilograms, three or four kilograms. It's like an eight pound ball bearing. I have no idea what sort of machine would need this, but uh, I, I saw it and I said, gotta have that. And yeah. because I put it on my desk and people come in and go, ooh, is it real? Is it a Christmas ornament? Sure, pick it up. And it, it's this massive thing. And it's one of these lovely little props on my desk that no one can keep their fingers off of. So instead of the steel ball today, I got a rock. Remember Charlie Brown in the uh, Halloween episode? I got a candy bar. I got a rock. <laughs> so I have a rock today. <laughs> and this is this is a fairly good sized chunk of rock from out in my 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 garden. It's not uh, a meteorite. Right, not a meteorite. Uh, okay. I live up on a hilltop, so it's very rocky here. And so mm -hmm. I have this baseball. I have the rock. The baseball weighs um, oh perhaps a hundred hundred and fifty grams. The rock weighs almost two kilos. And so these are very different weight things. And yet, if I were to go and hang out the window of my uh, second story office here, which I'm not going to do, and drop these two, they would fall at the same speed and they would land at the same time. And this is an idea that, again, we all take for granted because we've been taught. And it's the old curse of the, you know, learn, believe, repeat methodology. We've been taught that this happens, but we haven't, very few of us have been allowed to investigate why this happens or how it works. And it's relatively, it's quite easy and inexpensive and fun to do in a classroom. And I'm, that's what we're gonna do today. So Galileo took a look at this. And as we mentioned last week, Galileo noticed as we all do, gee, if you drop something, it falls very quickly. We live on a relatively high gravity planet uh, and Galileo wanted to slow the motion down. He did that with ramps. The only difficulty is that ramps are tricky because things don't roll the way they fall. If you were to take a, uh, say a bicycle wheel and a, uh, a metal ball or a wooden ball that weighed the same, mm -hmm. say a, a lightweight bicycle wheel and one of these big wooden bocce balls or a bowling ball, and you were to roll them down, the ball would beat the hoop every time because the weight is, it takes energy to make something spin. And if we uh. think about taking a big object like a hammer, well, you know what? How easy it is to swing or to spin it around 
depends very much on how we grab it. If we grab it by the bottom of the handle, we're feeling the weight at the end and we have to put a lot of muscular force in to drive a nail. If we mm -hmm. grab the metal end and swing the wooden part, it's like there's almost nothing there. So this rotation is very different from falling. <clears throat> and I think Galileo, again, there's no historical evidence for this, but I believe Galileo and all his work with ramps must have recognized this. And he didn't have the math for that either. It's called moment of inertia if you want to explore. But basically, uh, Galileo actually did this. I see one of our friends there on screen with Scott. Uh, <laughs> So Galileo actually did this. He traveled to the city of Pisa, the famous leaning tower of Pisa. And he climbed up the tower. And I don't know if anybody does this today. I hope they do. I would hope they have some kind of historical reenactment, much like the Civil War reenactments you see. Uh, Galileo went to the top and he had a board, a regular wooden board with two indentations in it. And on it, he put two different iron balls. I suspect they were actually cannonballs. He put a relatively small one and a substantially larger one that outweighed the little one. If it was twice as large, it would outweigh it by eight times. And uh, he took the board and tipped it so that both balls fell at the same time. And of course, the two balls fell together and struck the ground with one resounding thump. Mm -hmm. And why was this astonishing? I tell people this today and I say, oh, here we go. We've got two different objects and they're different sizes and we drop them and they fall at the same time and strike the ground. And students kind of have a, well, duh, reaction. So I turn it around on them. Hmm. Galileo's working to prove Aristotle wrong, as we know, his, his lifelong dream to prove Copernicus right. And I'll say, okay, here we go. Heavy object, light object. Which one has more downward force? Well, it doesn't have, it doesn't take much genius to say, well, uh, I have to work a lot harder to lift the rock. So you say, okay, so the rock has a lot more downward force. Yes. Okay, let's go back to our baseball. If I throw it harder, does it go faster? Well, yes, it does. Say, mm -hmm. okay, when I drop the rock in the baseball and the rock has a lot more downward force, why doesn't it go faster? If yeah, it's why? Duh, obvious, then you should be able to tell me if it, there's more downward <laughs> force on the rock, why doesn't it fall? Yeah, faster? why? I would often impersonate Aristotle. My students detested this when I did it. Later on, and years later, they've been, they told me that was really cool, but I hated it at the time. And I would come in and say, I'm your sub. My name's Aristotle. Please forgive the accent. I'm Greek. Here we go. And I want to tell you that the earth is fixed. And someone would say it was broken. And I would say, no, no, <laughs> it's fixed as if you glued it down. It doesn't spin, it doesn't turn, it's not moving anywhere. The earth is a fixed object. And about this time, yeah, this is one of the first ones I did. And they're all yeah. like, what do you want? And can I have some? They're all kind of like, you know, this, come on, you're, you're putting this on, this is, this is nonsense. And I would come and I would say, okay, uh, here's a rock. Could you throw this? And they would say, well, yeah, sure. And we go, okay, let's say we had a rock the size of your desk, your school desk. Could you throw that? Well, don't be silly. That's much too heavy. That has to weigh a ton or more. Well, how about a mountain? Could you move that? No. Well, could you move it with a shovel? Well, maybe it would take a long time. I'm like, okay but could you put enough force on it to move it without shattering it? Could you get a bulldozer to move the mountain that wouldn't break it into pieces, break chunks off? Oh well, no. Well, okay, how much bigger is the earth than a mountain, than a school desk, than a rock I can pick up out of the garden? How could you possibly move it without destroying it? If something is that massive, the amount yeah. of force to move it would be amazing. And wouldn't that just tear it to pieces? You know, it's kind of like when you see these memes, you know, uh, Aristotle was right, prove me wrong. <laughs> you see these memes on social media. All yeah. Someone will have something on a sign and guys sitting there with a cup of coffee that says, prove me wrong. So I'm Aristotle, prove me wrong. 40 years of teaching and 35 or more of teaching astronomy, I have yet to have a student who is able to defeat Aristotle's arguments. 
And so, of course, then I switch characters. I'm not Aristotle anymore. I'm Dr. Barth. Let's, now that you've wrestled with the problem of how to prove Galileo wrong and failed, let's have a little bit of golf clap appreciation for the intellectual mastery of Galileo, who did this first. And so we're going to take a look and we're going to see why do heavy things fall at the same speed than lightweight things. I'm going to have a spoiler. The answer to this, Scott, you know what it is. It's inertia. And when we realize, oh, if I have a lightweight thing and a heavyweight thing, and I try to throw both of them, guess what? I can throw the baseball substantially farther than the rock because it takes a lot more force to move the rock. Why? We say, oh, because it's heavier. And yet, if the rock were weightless out in space, the situation would be the same. And many of us have experience with weightless objects, Scott, even though we haven't gone to space. You ever been out in a small boat, like a canoe or a fishing boat? Sure. Yeah. And if you've had this experience where, oh, <clears throat> I need to shove the boat away from the dock. I've gotten in my little bass boat and I'm going out for a day of fishing. So I'm going to shove away from the dock with an oar or something before I start the motor. And you're like, mm. it takes a fair amount of force. And yet the boat is weightless. The water is supporting, buoying up its entire way. The boat is weightless. And it's not because of friction with the water either. It's just that heavy things are hard to move. Hmm. They have inertia. And Galileo was the first one to realize that it has nothing to do with weight. It simply has to do with the more mass you have, the more force it requires. And this, of course, is Newton's second law of motion, F equals MA, <clears throat> or force divided by mass gives you acceleration. Newton says, gee, if you're dividing by a bigger mass, you're going to get less acceleration. Uh, if any of us have a very small car with a small engine, <coughs> oh, excuse me, we realize that uh, the car performs differently when we have a lot of passengers or a lot of cargo. If you have a pickup and you go and you get 20 bags of cement and then put, toss them in the back and then drive away, ah, oh, this thing is sluggish now. If you're on a bicycle, well, a lot of us have done this on kids. We're on a bicycle and somebody says, can I have a ride on the handlebars? And then you go to pedal and you realize, wow, it's a lot harder. A lot harder. It's a lot harder. And it's not because you're holding up their weight. The handlebars are doing that. You're simply providing the force to move them forward. And so Galileo took this and he went and he looked at pendulums. So I'm going to take a look. You're going to see my very, very sophisticated pendulum setup. And uh, uh, these are different links. I'm going to have to see if I can correct that. But here we have, Scott, this is, a, uh, this is just a plain old wrench. And you don't need a wrench. You can use a pencil or anything else. Right. And uh, I'm going to see if I can shorten up these weights. In any case, what we've got here is just uh, these are sockets and yeah. a washer so they don't slide off the string. And uh, I was trying to get these measured and accurate before the show. And I'm going to see if I can uh, adjust them maybe a little bit. So they're about the same length. I think I can do that, relatively speaking. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this, and we're going to swing these and let them swing back and forth. And uh, the interesting thing I, I would do in, in the classroom is I would go ahead and uh, I would tie some string you know, the little suspended ceilings with the white ceiling tiles in the classroom. And I would go up and I would tie string to uh, one of these rails that holds the tiles and hang them down. And I would hang various weights. And I used the brass laboratory weights. You can use anything. Washers work well, but the weights were nice because there's, there's no magic in it. It's one piece of solid metal. You would tie these up and very carefully adjust the length. And you would go, OK, kids. We're tying this up. We're going to carefully adjust the length. They're the same length. They're different weights. And now you ask people, please predict for me. We have a heavyweight object and we have a lightweight object. Please tell me which one will swing faster, which one will swing slower. And when we do that, 
And I've got two that are about the same length here. I'm gonna go ahead and set these up. I'm gonna switch my camera. And I'd like the viewers to think about this. Think about uh, the idea of, uh, let's see, where's my little camera icon? There it is. So I can switch to the USB camera. There we are. And you see we Here have this little tripod today. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're gonna try this a couple of ways, but the first way we're gonna try it uh, I see I'm going to have to, uh, my strings are a little too long for the tripod I got. Uh, okay, I'm just going to try this by hand. We're going to, we're just going to rock with this and we're going to try it by hand. So we've got uh, two weights here and I've separated them. And ideally, Scott, you want to do this with uh, some weights which are suspended from a bookshelf or a door frame. Some stationary, books. right? Right. Stationary is not going to rock. And I'm going to use a, uh, and I'm going to, oh, okay, so I got one that's obviously heavy on uh, the viewer's right and obviously lighter weight on the viewer's left. So which one will go faster? And when I drop them, we see that, holy cow, Batman, they're both yeah. swinging in just about the same, the same tempo. And they get off a little bit. I suspect that's because of my, my arm is uh, not as steady as a rock here. And I try it again, and I see that, oh my gosh, they yeah. swing together. And it doesn't matter how heavy or how light <clears throat> something is, <clears throat> because I have one here that's really lightweight. It's just a washer, and right? It's, or uh, almost. Yeah, it's, uh, I think what I've got is a, uh, a uh, this is an 8, uh, a 12, and a 15 millimeter socket. If it's really important to folks out there, the only thing is this one is a little shorter. And so if this heavier works, falls faster, let's take a look and we see that, oh, wow, the one that's shorter is swinging faster than the other two. Hmm. How could that and, be? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a very, uh, it's a very beautiful and clear demonstration. It's very easy to do. And when we look at the pendulum, we have this idea, oh, it swings back and forth. But in fact, it falls from its high position to a low position. It's just the swing, the string makes it take a curved path. You can think of a child on a swing set. And in fact, the swing forces us into a curved path and it slows us down. But if you've ever jumped off a swing when it's maybe a little too high for you, you landed with a big thump. Sure. You have this idea that, yes, it really is uh, quite a fall. And swinging back and forth is falling, just as orbits are falling. Objects in orbit are falling. And so we look at this, and we're going to take a look at, gee, why does this happen? Why does the rock and the baseball fall at the same speed? And uh, you may know, Scott, I'm going to find another picture on my set here. Uh, here we go. This is a, I'm going to put up a lovely painting. I'm going to try to, there we go. I'm going to enlarge. Book Davy says from potential to kinetic back to potential. Very That's good. Only part Precisely of it. right. Yep. Precisely right. <clears throat> That's exactly true. And I'm going to share this. And this is a lovely painting, Scott. I'm sure you'll probably, you are likely to recognize this. Do you recognize the painting and do you know who did it? Alan Bean. Very good. Very good. Apollo astronaut Alan Bean did the painting. And uh, the fellow in the painting is Commander Dave Scott from Apollo 15. Beautiful painting. The lander behind him, you know, they all named them, right? Yes. Lighter and gumball and all sorts of names. His lander was named Falcon. And so what you see down here in the bottom corner is a falcon feather. I don't know, people would probably howl today because falcons are endangered, but they found, they're NASA, so they can do things we can't. They found a falcon feather, and here's a geologist hammer, and he took them to the moon, and on live TV, he said, well, we're going to repeat Galileo's famous experiment because on the moon there is no air. And he dropped the feather and the hammer, and in fact, they fell together and struck the lunar surface at the same instant. The classic cool? 
physics experiment like this is called a guinea and feather tube. It was developed, I think, by Chadwick. Uh, but he had a tube where he could pump all the air out, and he had a little electromagnetic trap door, and he put a guinea coin, which is a, a, a was at one time a gold coin, fairly heavy, and a small feather from a bird, like a starling. And he put them both on the trap door. And in fact, when the air was gone, they would fall together. And uh, you always get the clever student who says, well, here's, look, here's a rock and a piece of paper, or here's a rock and a leaf, and they don't fall the same. <clears throat> and the answer, of course, is air resistance. Mm -hmm. On the moon, there is none. And this, of course, tells us why did Galileo choose large and small cannonballs? because the weight of the cannonball means that, in fact, air resistance has little effect on it. Uh, we know that air resistance affects everyone. Uh, again, for every object, there is what we call a terminal velocity. How fast can you fall through an atmosphere? Mice are a very interesting case. Mice cannot die from a fall. Did you know that? No. Mice that cannot die from a fall. Their mass and their body shape is such that when they hit terminal velocity, they are not falling at a speed they cannot walk away from. Wow. Exactly. So we can take a couple of mice, drop it off the Empire State Building. They're going to be fine. I don't encourage this experiment. It seems like it would be awfully cruel. <laughs> and the mouse would probably, you know, re relieve himself <laughs> on the way down. It would, or maybe he would hit somebody. But in fact, um, People have done this experiment and mice huh. can die from falling. Uh, wow. You can drop a mouse off out of a, you know, off a 10 story building and it will hit the ground and walk away because it hits terminal velocity, which is not lethal velocity. Um, skydivers. Again, yeah. bringing up skydivers, a sport I've never participated in and never will. But skydivers hit a terminal velocity of about 250 to 300 miles an hour. You now, can't. there have been skydivers that have walked away, or at least live. Yes, yes. At least there, live. there have been skydivers that have walked away. Yeah. Uh, don't try this at home. <laughs> Do there not try a, this. <laughs> there's an internet video of some, I think he's nuts, a daredevil, who basically yeah. jumped from 10,000 feet and landed in a net, like a circus net. I think uh, I've seen And that. I'm sure he worked out. He did all the math, kids. How, how strong the nat, nat, uh, <laughs> That's a nat believer. Be, That's a believer in math the right there. To be. Uh, but he landed in a circus net. And I'm like, oh my God, but what if there was a gust of wind and you missed? Uh, <laughs> but in fact, things falling through an atmosphere hit a, a terminal velocity. And a leaf hits a terminal velocity a lot faster than a cannonball. So Galileo used two cannonballs. We use pendulums, which fall only a very small distance. So again, air resistance isn't an issue. And the longer the cord you use, the more sweeping and majestic the movements of the pendulum are. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure many of our viewers have seen these uh, Foucault pendulum displays in a museum where there's a, a ball about the size of a bowling ball. And yes. uh, there was one in Griffith Observatory. That's right. That's a classic. A great big brass ball with a little pin underneath it. And they would set up at the beginning of the day uh, a couple hundred of little round pegs, little cylinders. And as the pendulum precessed, it would knock a peg over and people would stand and watch for many minutes for the, the pendulum to rotate a little bit and knock the next peg over. Uh, so pendulums are loads of fun. So we're going to take a trip, a little dodge into some math. So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, I'm going to pull up some of my <clears throat> stuff here. So let's consider this idea. And I'm hoping uh, this comes up on a different page. There we are. This is our old uh, gravitational idea from Newton. And it basically says, ah, here we go. Uh, whoops. It says action and reaction. The Earth and the moon pull on each other the exact same amount of force. And we take Newton's uh, universal gravitation equation up here. And we said, oh, it depends on the mass of the Earth and the mass of the Moon and the square of the distance between them. This is a universal constant named for Newton, his universal gravitational constant. And here's the force of gravity. Okay, so we have this idea. <clears throat> well, what about it? Well, if we look at this idea, 
And let's take this and put it in with, here's another one, I'm gonna blow this up so it's easy for our viewers to see. So here's the idea of Newton's universal gravity. And here's Newton's second law of motion, force equals mass times acceleration. Here we're using mass and gravity as the acceleration. Well, you realize, oh, both of these things are solving for the, the same force, the force of gravity. Mm -hmm. And so, ooh, we can set them equal to each other. And that's what we've done here. And we realize, oh, well, if they're equal to each other, then the mass of the earth cancels out. It disappears. If we're multiplying both sides of an equation by six, we can get rid of the six because it doesn't change anything. And so what we end up with something here and we realize, oh, the acceleration of gravity, all it depends on is the mass of the earth. R is how far are you away from the center? Hmm. What's, what's your altitude? Sea level? Are you on a mountaintop here in, uh, at the Barthland Ranch and Observatory? I'm at about uh, 1,350 feet. Not sure what that is in meters right off the bat. I'd have to convert. Uh, but uh, it's about 350 meters. So I'm at a certain altitude. My acceleration of gravity here is particular to my altitude. If you go to the top of Mount Everest, you're another, wow, you're another nine kilometers higher. But you know what, Scott? Hmm. That nine kilometer difference fades to, incons to virtually nothing compared to the 6,000 kilometer radius of the Earth. Right. So when we talk about this idea of why do all things fall at the same acceleration? Well, we're all essentially about the same distance from the center of the earth. Doesn't matter where we are on the earth's surface. If we're up in an airplane or if we're on top of a great mountain or if we're at the bottom of a large rift trench like Death Valley, uh, 300 or so feet below, 100 meters below sea level. Well, you know what? <clears throat> doesn't matter because compared to the radius of the earth, those minuscule changes. Yeah. And I, I think uh, we all know that if we made a life scale map of the earth or globe of the earth the size of a baseball, it would be much smoother than an orange is. Right. We would have no, we would have no craggy peaks that stick out as much as the stitches on our baseball do. And so we look at this idea and we say, wow, Newton showed us why. Galileo showed us what happened. Newton went ahead and showed us, wow, here's why it works that way. It turns mm -hmm. out that the only thing that controls the acceleration of gravity is the mass of a planet and its physical size and radius. And so we put that in, and this is how we find out the moon has about one-sixth the gravitational pull of the Earth. Jupiter has about four gravities at its cloud tops. The sun, because it's so much more massive, if you could stand at the surface of the sun, you would be smushed by 30 Gs, which would crush and kill you. People talk about, oh, if you fell into the sun. <laughs> right. The gravitational effects would be awful. Even if you could have a Superman type shield that would protect you from the heat and radiation, the gravity would flatten you. Yeah. And so we get to this lovely activity and idea. <clears throat> I hope uh, our viewers will download this lovely activity uh, that you have on the explorescientific.com slash yes. no page. They are welcome to write to me at astronomyforeducators at gmail.com. I'm also happy to send them uh, this curriculum and other things. Uh, and if you have questions, how do I implement this? And I've had questions, Scott, how do I implement this for older students, for younger students? And uh, in fact, I'm happy to help any educator who wants to write to me or astronomy outreach person who wants to write to me. How do I do this for an astronomy club? Let's get together and help you make your program amazing. That's great. And so with all that, I'm going to wrap up today's show and uh, off to other professorly duties. <laughs> All right. Well, it was great to, um, it was fun to do the show at this time. Uh, we had uh, some viewers that we don't normally have, and one of them was all the way from Turkey. So, outstanding. But thanks for watching. Uh, 
and uh, maybe we, uh, uh, Dan and I talk about uh, our scheduled time and everything like that. But um, until next Monday, uh, uh, we will uh, bid you adieu. Um, and, and next Monday, Monday is episode number seven. Do and you already then, know what the uh, program is going yes, to be? Yes, I do. Next week, we're going to go with something more astronomical, something that I get questions about a lot. And that's how do telescopes work in terms of magnification and resolution? Oh, I'm going to I love that one. Okay. You've probably experienced this, Scott. You set up a telescope and people come up in public and probably the most common question you get, how many power is that thing? Yeah, right? that's right. Oh, oh, oh I, that's I, the number I, one I question, good, right? Right. How you powerful say, oh, is well, that we're telescope? At a, at a cluster at 35 power. Well, I've got one at home from Kmart that'll do 200 power. Isn't that any good? <laughs> that's right. So we're going to next week's topic power. is magnification. Yes, you can. No, you can't. Right. So we're going to deal with it next week. Thanks, Scott. All right. Thank you. Thanks uh, to the audience for watching, and um, uh, we will see you soon. Bye-bye. Take everyone. care. Roberts from Explore Scientific and today I want to talk about the world famous Galileo telescope kit. This is a kit that you assemble by yourself. You'll learn how optics work by assembling the objective lens uh, and also the eyepiece and there's two different eyepieces that are in this. A 25 power 20 millimeter eyepiece but it also comes with this very clever little device here that works both as a Barlow lens that will double the magnification of this eyepiece, making it 50 power, or it can be used also as a Galilean eyepiece, which gives 17 power to the telescope. This is what Galileo virtually saw through his own telescope. So you can have that same experience that Gal Galileo had looking at the moon, uh, looking at Saturn's rings, looking at Jupiter. Uh, it is a telescope that was designed for the International Year of Astronomy in 2009. And uh, it's a fantastic kit, both for child and adult, uh, to learn how a telescope works. And so if you get the telescope like this, you can either have it on a stand like this, you can hand hold it like a pirate's glass, or on the bottom here, we have a uh, threaded hole here that you can put it on a camera tripod. Very versatile, very rugged, and a lot of fun, all from Explore Scientific.